Now friends, I have finished 38 lectures on the subject of extraction of non-ferrous metals. And then I invited a good friend of mine, Mr. Pugajendi, who has delivered two very beautiful lectures. I had specially requested him to talk about the importance of non-ferrous metallurgy as regards the economy of India today. How there is a resurgence in the non-ferrous industry, how it can be an attractive option from our metallurgy graduates. And you will appreciate how beautifully he has presented the subject. He holds a very important position and he is very well thought of in the non-ferrous metals uh, academia as well as the industry circle. Fortunately, he has repeated far more effectively some of the things I had mentioned about our history and how things are changing. I would not go into that. In the next two lectures, what I propose to do is to go through the entire set of lectures that I have delivered and remind you of some important points. Now, I have mentioned and I will mention it again that you always understand principles better once you know what actual processes there are. And you understand processes better when you know the principles, they go hand in hand. So, we started uh, 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 the lectures with discussion of uh, fundamental principles, then we talked about processes trying to point out how the principles apply, but I am sure you begin to understand the importance of the principles only when we discussed the uh, processes. Now that you have understood a bit some of the principles and you have been become familiar with the processes, the techniques and some details, I can now have a different kind of discussion putting them together. So, I will do that uh, for next two lectures, 41 and 42nd lecture. Uh, you would recall that I had started my lectures by saying how non-ferrous extractive metallurgy is a bit different from the other undergraduate metallurgy subjects. Some people think of it as more of very descriptive, not very analytical, not very quantitative. I hope that I have been able to show at least to some extent that non-ferrous extractive metallurgy is really not that dull a subject. There is a lot of logic, there is a lot of beauty in the things that are done. It is true that there is a lot, lot of chemistry, more of chemistry than of physics, not that much of mathematics, but certainly there is rationality and some quantification, quantitative principle. I, I started by mentioning two equations one on reduction of titanium tetrachloride by magnesium and sodium and another was on aluminothermic reduction. Now, so far as this reaction is concerned, in course of chemistry, we will write these two equations and that is the end of the matter, but I mentioned in my lecture that for a metallurgist, it becomes a starting point for asking questions as to how do these reactions actually take place, their mechanisms are different. And subsequently, I have discussed and shown that the magnesium reduction often produces a different kind of product, a powdery titanium because it is a molecular reaction, whereas the sodium reaction produces a crystalline product because it is electrochemical in nature. So, the reaction mechanism is very important. In the second reaction, there was another reaction that that is yes, I will explain why the sodium reaction is electrochemical because there is subhalides in the sodium chloride phase which can be detected and 
much of the reaction take place because of the sodium vapors reacting with subhalides in sodium chloride phase and not sodium vapor and titanium tetrafluoride uh, molecules in a gas phase. That reaction is not very probable and that was the basis of explaining how things happen at all. And then I said if there is a metallic conductor, then it is conducive to uh, electrochemical reaction that is why you must have a metallic chamber. The other reaction was aluminothermic reduction of metal oxide. This such a reaction is exothermic, it produces a lot of heat. So, in a chemistry course, one may learn that it this reaction is very favorable from energy point of view, because it is exothermic and it is autogenous actually. Once you set it off, you do not it does not need any external heat supply. But later on in the course, we have learnt that you have to analyze energy requirements by looking at things in a holistic manner. If you take into account the energy that is required to produce aluminum to start with, then this reaction is not necessarily favorable from energy point of view. It may generate some heat all right, it may not need much of an external heat supply, but it has the raw material has consumed energy in the first place and if you take that into account, by taking that account you have to calculate process fuel equivalent PFE and unless that is favorable you cannot call this favorable. As a matter of fact it is really not favorable because aluminum needs enormous amount of energy in its production. So, in our non-ferrous metallurgy course we will look at reactions from a different angle in terms of mechanism and in terms of thermodynamics, in terms of kinetics and that is what I moved into subsequently. I, I did show you this poem that uh, says that iron is master of them all, but then non-ferrous metals are not necessarily poor cousins of uh, steel, they have their uses and some uses are absolutely uh, strategic and critical. You cannot think of modern age without aluminum alloys, titanium alloys who, which go for aerospace applications. You cannot think of copper which go in for electrical applications. You cannot think of the electronic industry without silicon and there are many, many uh, non-ferrous metals which are vitally required for various applications. So, we can call steel master of the iron master of them all, but the others are really not. Uh, that inferior. Then I had given you some figures and Mr. Pugajendi has given some more figures which are perhaps more correct and more up to date. The idea was to show that the non-ferrous metals industry in our country is expanding, but even then we are far behind the international scenario, particularly if you look at aluminum which is so very important for India's economy that industry has to expand in a big way and all metallurgy graduates will have a very important role to play if we want to sustain the growth and expansion of our non-ferrous metals industry. Now having said that, I went back into the history because in our learning objectives it was there to discuss past also. And so, what we did, we discussed very briefly about the history of non-ferrous metal production in India and we, I mentioned that our history is, was something very enviable. In ancient world, seven or eight metals were known and from ancient times India was producing them, but India had something which no other nation had until very recent times, it was zinc. India learned to produce zinc very early by 4th or 5th century AD and the industry came to uh, uh, almost a peak by 11th and 12th century until after the um, Muslim invasion uh, things began to decline. There is a reason why Indians are so crazy about zinc because zinc went in for making brass which was almost a substitute for gold. Indians have always been crazy about gold. So, they were alchemists 
like Nagarjuna, who was trying to make gold. And very often the brass they made was just as good as gold. And when kings and emperors ran out of gold to cover their temples and monuments, they fell back on brass. Brass was, and also for the ordinary public who couldn't afford gold, uh, brass was good because it, it, it also shined uh, like, shone like gold. Now, after having discussed the history, uh, and uh, we showed some very good, nice pictures also, I have referred to these couple of books, which I recommend you read sometime, maybe after your graduation, to know about the, our the minerals and metals in ancient India. There are two volumes. One volume is on archaeological evidence, the other is on literary evidence for all our texts. We know about what was there, to what extent they were there. There is another book on minerals and metals in pre modern India, just when the Britishers came. That also gives us a lot of things about what was happening in the area of non ferrous metals. And then, then we went through some, I will go through them quickly, over the development of the metals by mankind over the sense over the millennia. Actually, things began to happen in Egypt, Mesopotamia, then Indus Valley, and then China also started. Many of them started independently, or they have been exchange of information. But we know that around 2500 BC, there was onset of Chalcolithic age, which meant copper and stone. People were beginning to come from stone age to use of copper. And first came bronze, because tin has a lower melting point and bronze had beautiful properties. And very often we say ayas, that, that is referred to in Veda, is not necessarily iron. Ayas could mean bronze also. People became familiar with gold, copper, silver, lead, tin, mercury, iron, antimony also. Then, how copper and iron came, they may have been kind of accidental. There are many conjectures. I have talked about them. The point to note is that zinc came into the picture as a metal much later. And India was the first country to learn this around 400 AD. West learnt the technique only in the 18th century, because the Indian uh, producers had kept their uh, technique hidden from the rest of the world. Only from the end of 18th century, many newer metals were beginning to be discovered. Before that, there were only a handful of metals. And strangely, aluminum could not be produced. It was produced in smaller, small quantities by chemi chemistry. But it could be produced in bulk, because three things happened together. We had the invention of electricity. Electricity was could be used for electrolysis, and the process was invented simultaneously in America and France. They are called hall heroes process, which was possible because there was electricity. But it was also made possible because huge quantities of pure alumina could be produced by Bayer's process. If Bayer's process wasn't there, it wouldn't be possible to produce aluminum in bulk because you cannot electrolyze bauxite as it is. You have to purify, you have to produce pure alumina. For that, you need Bayer's process. So, in technology, many advancements have taken place because two, three things have happened simultaneously and they have helped each other. Aluminum is an example. I have talked in detail about the literary evidence in our ancient texts, starting from Rig Veda, mention of various metals and alloys. I have talked about archaeological 
evidences from numerous excavations which have yielded thousands of artifacts of all kinds of metals and alloys. Not only sculpture, but tools, weapons, personal ornaments, objects of domestic use, everything figure in there. They are distributed all over India. There is a large concentration in western India, but then things spread to the south, down to, to the east. So, there were numerous sites in India where these things uh, were produced. Here was a story as to how the ancients learned to iron production. Then this is one of the oldest uh, examples of a non-ferrous metal figurine in India, the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro. It is a small sculpture uh, with very interesting features, bangles only uh, in the left arm. Unfortunately, this is Mohenjo-daro is no longer in India, it is in Pakistan now. But then from the submerged Dwarka of the coast of Gujarat, lots of objects have been found, which were made of copper, zinc, lead and all kinds of alloys. And he, here is a picture showing where all where archaeological sites have been found that have yielded many, many non-ferrous metal objects. I showed you pictures of some ancient copper making furnaces, also distillation units for zinc. Many of them are still intact in the hill sites in Rajasthan, because it almost looks like when the distillation units were all charged and ready for production, maybe they were flooded and those who were to operate them, they left the area, they are found intact. On the hill sites, you find these retorts. Indians used both horizontal retorts as well as vertical retorts. Mr. Pugajendi is showing some pictures. Then I showed some beautiful uh, sculpture starting from um, early as early as 7th or 8th century. They were brasses, bronzes and they, they are they are astounding not only because of the quality of the alloy that was produced in India, but also the beauty uh, and the aesthetics, the craftsmanship, the high skill of the artisans. And one of the techniques they mastered was the lost wax process, where actually things that were made, they were really not solid, they are all very hollow. Uh, so, there is a thin layer of metal which makes these things. The famous Nataraja, which it is its beauty has an international impact. And so many books have been written on it. There is a book called the Tao of Physics, where there is a big chapter on this Nataraja concept. What all symbols are there? What all it means? And the author has thinks that is one of the most beautiful things. This is Ardhanadiswara. There is also another sculpture. Then in recent time, pre-modern times, when the just Mughals were declining, they made this beautiful birti ware. There was another special kind of alloy and special kind of craftsmanship. So, I have discussed all this. This was the first module, which was kind of introductory to the course. Then I came to the second module which was little more on the dull side, the descriptive, but it had to be done. It was the learning objectives was sources of non-ferrous metal, land and sea, principles of exploration, principles of ore beneficiation and something about the non-ferrous metal wealth. The point to note in this was that metals do not come from land alone, there are metals in the sea also and I have given you some data on their distribution. So far as the land is concerned, we can extract metals only from the surface of earth. The surface includes sea also. When we say crust of the earth, it is about a few kilometers is what we can normally uh, 
take samples out from. So, the average things uh, percentages have been shown and that I have discussed at the end of the lectures also that we have shown that oxygen, silicon, aluminum these are there in plenty and that is why you find oxide silicates there is also calcium is also there. Some of the other metals we are very familiar with like base metals copper, lead, zinc their abundance is very low. So, had they been distributed uniformly all over the crust it will be very difficult to extract them. Fortunately, there are pockets where they are concentrated that what helps us to get them um, extract them. So, we have discussed the nature of occurrence that different metals because of their difference in reactivities occur in different forms. Some in some form they are more stable, some minerals are more stable, they are difficult to decompose, some other minerals are not so stable. I have given you some tables about that and I then I have said that an extraction process will have to take into account the percentage of impurities, their association, physical conditioning of the ore, location and magnitude, proximity to transport facilities, market value of the metal if at all extracted then value of land, cost of rehabilitation, environmental, social concerns all these to set up a non ferrous metal industry. So, many many factors go into the production of non ferrous metals. It starts with exploration that are based on uh, magnetic studies on land, studies on electrical resistivity. These things tell us where water bodies are there some of some such things can be done from air also aeroplanes flow according to some grids and electrical flow lines or equipotential lines are drawn which indicate where water where where over bodies may be there and then detailed explorations are done where actual samples are taken out the samples analyzed doing all this only people go for exploration now, if we take the world average, the average composition of the crust, this is the list of abundance. The elements on top are oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium and then there is a after magnesium there is a drastic drop and I have said a few elements account for more than 95 percent of the abundance, but still we managed to get many many elements which are the average shows very low figures, but fortunately they are found concentrated in certain areas that is why we were able to extract them. Interestingly we should not we should remember that C also contains all elements because over the millennia rivers have washed down things all from all all corners of the earth surface and dissolve them. Elements come from the bottom of the sea also through undersea cracks or volcanoes through which things are constantly coming out. On an average these are this is a relative abundance of course, chlorine is maximum that is why we have chloride, chloride salts, we have sodium and magnesium these are sodium chloride and magnesium chloride. There, there is also other things sulfur, calcium whole lot of things and if you go down you can find there also precious metals are also there like you have gold, gold, silver all that is there, but then because the percentage is so small even uranium is there it is not easy to extract those things from sea water. Fortunately, there are there is some concentrated source of things in the sea in the form of manganese nodules, solid nodules which are continuously forming and getting distributed in sea floors not in a uniform manner. Some sea floors have more, some have less. They are very rich in manganese because the highest concentration is we call them manganese nodules. It might look like a very good source of manganese, but unfortunately on land also we have very rich manganese 
very manganese is available on land. But it is more attractive from the point of, point of view of cobalt, zinc, which compared to what is available on land is very attractive. And people are interested in extracting cobalt, zinc, nickel, etcetera from those manganese nodules. But then extracting manganese nodules from the bottom of the sea, which could be several kilometers down, is not an easy proposition. There are fortunately some shallow seas which also have these manganese nodules. So, extraction has to start from there. India is very much in this game. The National Metallurgical Laboratory, Hindustan Zinc Limited, which is now Sterlite in regional research laboratory, which is now called Institute of Minerals and Materials Technology. A program has been going on for 20 years and it has gone to a pilot plant scale. But it is basically for the future that if you really have to get cobalt, zinc, nickel, we can get from the manganese nodules, but the process would become better, more economical. when. We extract also manganese and iron, which are in good quantities. Then the total on the on the whole the economics will be better. We have talked about worldwide distribution of important metals, which which country is richer in, which the God has not been kind to every country in the same manner. Some countries are very rich in mineral deposits. America, South Africa, parts of Soviet Union, Australia, very rich in mineral wealth. India is rich in some, but not rich in some others. We would have liked it to. For example, the mineral wealth of India is adequate to abundant so far as ores of aluminum beryllium, chromium, chromium, manganese, magnesium, titanium, zirconium, thorium and the rare earths are concerned. We say that we have inadequate, but we have some definitely ores of copper, gold. I put graphite here also because it is an important thing though it is not a metal. Lead, vanadium, zinc, cadmium, nickel, uranium, tin we have, but poor to not known so far are they also include many metals, antimony, bismuth, boron, cobalt, mercury, molybdenum, etcetera, silver, tungsten, they are not there. So, Indian metal industry, non ferrous metal industry has to depend a great deal on where we have adequate or abundant resources. It does not mean we should ignore the others, because if we have the skill, if we have the knowledge, we can always import concentrates from elsewhere and process them and produce add value. You can get concentrates of those metals which are available in other countries and if they are willing to sell, we can add value extract those metals. Then we went into the subject of mineral beneficiation, which very often starts with crushing and grinding. There are some pictures of grinders. Say this grinding always has the has the ore particles go through a gap where we have the grinding surfaces rotating to force the particles to go through, and that's when size reduction takes place. There are different kinds of mills. These are self-explanatory, but towards the end of my lectures, I mentioned these days. The subject of crushing and grinding is becoming very important because it is extremely energy consuming step in the entire process of mineral beneficiation. We saw that in copper extraction processes, 75 percent of the energy is going into the very first step of crushing and grinding to get produce a ore, fine ore from which but through flotation will get a copper concentrate. So, there is, there is now tremendous urge to develop newer kind of 
crushers and grinders. And we have talked about high pressure grinding mills, where suppose if this is the kind of grinder, these two rolls will be pressing from two directions as the uh, particles go through, they are not fixed. So, these high pressure grinding mills are more efficient, they save on energy. This is regarding how particles fracture, they can fracture along the grains, they can fracture across the grains. Then I have talked about what kind of particle size that different particles have. Then we have come to various methods of concentration and there the central thing to remember is different minerals have different kinds of properties. Magnetic susceptibility of one mineral is different from the other, electrical susceptibility, their, their density, size, shape, they are different. So, these properties will be exploited. An electrostatic separator exploits electrical conduction properties. Like if we have a rotating drum that attracts particles, which are most attracted that fraction will go here. No, the other way the electrically conducting particles will go there, non conducting particles will go there. So, these are the kind of properties we exploit brittleness just by crushing and grinding we can separate fractions, size difference, size and density magnetic permeability subset, conductivity, surface properties, in flotation surface properties are done. I have given you one interesting example, which is used in processing of beach sands, which have come again and again when you talked about monazite uh, concentrate, you have talked about ilmenite processing, processing of beach sands in general. And because it is it's such an important area processing of beach sands, I took in the beginning only one uh, concentration device that was spiral concentrate, which is used for beach sands, which has many, many minerals, very heavy minerals, ilmenite, rutile, zircon, monazite, heavy minerals like garnet and silimanite, lighter minerals like silica. We need to fraction it, we need to separate all this and then they will go for their different circuits. And how does it function? I have, we have shown you a picture, a slurry will come down from the top, it will come at increasing velocity rotating and during the process of rotation, the particles, uh, minerals will get separated depending on their uh, density and shape. And we have explained how this happens that in the perimeter outermost mostly water with fine particles will go that can be collected separately. That is where just out inside the perimeter the velocity will be highest and there cannot be not much separation. Maximum separation will be inner regions which is where the velocity drops and begin begins to slow down and heavier minerals separate there. Then I have said the whole thing is really not very descriptive. We can now put in mathematical models, we can bring in computer applications, we can do optimization, we can consider a particular say a fraction heavy metal concentrate and we can do experiments and use uh, design of experiment to set up empirical equations from which we can optimize things to find what are the best conditions of getting one fraction out in quantity or quality. Something that the industry traditionally used to do by a lot of trial and error over years, now today can be done in a matter of days using computer packages. And then we have done this in Indian rare earths and we have made a lot of predictions, plotted this sort of response surfaces using standard computer packages to show under which conditions you get maximum concent concentrate, etcetera, etcetera. And they have been found useful in the industry. Then we move to 
module 3, which was principles of extraction and refining processes, and that was a fairly long film. Now, in many universities, there can be a full one semester course only on extraction processes. There can be a course only on principles of refining. Now, I have quizzed all that into a few lectures, taking something from here, something from there. And these lectures could never be a substitute for your learning by really going and reading various books which are available. Now, in the days of internet, on any subject, you can get so much of information. So, essentially, if you have a, 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 at least some idea as to what is what, you can always go to uh, a source where you will get lot more details when you need it. Now, in this module, our learning objectives was to understand why some metals exist in nature as stable complex minerals and some do not. We wanted to understand some thermodynamic and kinetic principles of heterogeneous reactions, because in metallurgy most reactions are heterogeneous. Heterogeneous means either solids liquiding with gases or gases and solids in contact or solids and liquids in contact. Very rarely we had an example of something happening in a homogeneous gas phase or a homogeneous liquid phase. So, you always talked about heterogeneous reactions, where more than one phase is involved. Then we went to understand principles of pyrometallurgy, electrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. This was where I showed a periodic table to tell you where we find metals, non-ferrous non metals. I, I, I told you that there are so many non-ferrous metals, about 80 of them, because all are non-ferrous metals. If you leave aside iron, the halogens and some elements which are solids, but they are not metals, because metals are supposed to have some properties like luster, some strength. Uh, and, but then there are some, some exceptions. I mean, graphite has luster, but it is not a metal. Mercury is not a solid. It has a luster, but it is a metal. Why we call them a metal? Because metals are supposed to have some reactivities. And to that, to show that, I showed you a table where metals have been listed in terms of their reactivities. Now, what is the criterion of reactivity? There are many criteria. I have listed here electrode potentials, apparent standard potential, standard formation potential of pure chloride, free energy formations of oxides and chloride, electronegativity. I have not gone far too deep in the subject, but I should mention this. There are different fundamental principles behind all such listing. The list we get using different criteria do not give identical listing, means which is on top here may not be on top there. But then by and large, you will find some metals are coming to the top, means they are very reactive. They are very reactive towards halogens, oxygen and not, things like that like cesium, potassium, beryllium, sodium, lithium, calcium, you will find them all at the top everywhere. Whereas, some metals like platinum, gold, silver, etcetera, they will all be at the bottom. They are not at all reactive. Metals like copper also will be towards the bottom. Things like lead, tin, iron, zinc, manganese, they will be somewhat at the in the middle. By electronegativity, we mean these are electropositive metals, going down is electronegative. Those which are electropositive will have greater negative values of free energies of formation 
of either oxides or chlorides means they make very stable compounds and when they are stable compounds it will be very difficult to dissociate and get the metal. Same in terms of electrode potential. Electrode potentials are with reference to hydrogen as one. Now, electrode potential tells us there is a line we can draw at hydrogen with reference to hydrogen taken as 0, all below elements below that metal below that are electro negative, all above that are electro positive, which means these metals should not normally be obtained from aqueous media by electrolysis, because if that comes it will immediately react with water and liberate hydrogen. Like if you have somehow get magnesium out of water, it will not be magnesium, it will react with water immediately liberate hydrogen. Normally that would happen for zinc also, zinc in an acid medium will liberate hydrogen. But when we pass a current there are some phenomena and that we have discussed called activation over potential which changes these electrode potentials because of certain reasons which I will discuss little later. And that is why under the conditions and passing of current this listing changes and hydrogen can will come on top of zinc and sometimes it can be done from manganese also. Means up to manganese all metals below that can be produced by electrolysis of aqua solutions, acid solutions. These the ones above cannot be. So, this gives us an idea as to what this listing is all about. If you go a little further, these reactivities would also tell us how they should exist in nature. Those which are up here will form very stable oxides, silicates, aluminates, halides in nature, very stable compounds. At the bottom when we have platinum group metals, gold, silver etcetera, their reactivity is very low, they will not form compounds, they can exist in free state. The ones which are near the bottom like lead, tin, nickel etcetera will form compounds, but very weak compounds they are very easy to dissociate, no problem at all. Little bit of uh, reducing atmosphere will reduce them. So, we made a category of metals, we put them into four categories depending on electrode potential, those which were very high, we said they form chlorides, carbonates, sulphates, etcetera, etcetera, very stable compounds. Then gradually they also had other property, those which are very stable compounds, they form, they will sp spontaneously react with water, they will form ionic compound. Those below will form also stable compounds, but they will not oxidize unless we heat them they will not oxidize spontaneously in air like sodium if you take it out in air it will oxidize, but these metals which are slightly less reactive will get oxidized only only heat and they will be attacked by steam, they will not be attacked by water because their reactivity is slightly less. If you go further down they will form simple or complex oxides or sulphides, they will oxidize only if there is a strong heating or there is a strong oxidizing agent, ores are easily reduced. Below that we are coming to elements which form weak compounds, they will form selenides, tellurides, arsenides which are very easy to reduce and of course, which will decompose at high temperatures only by heating such metals will not be attacked by steam. In many cases it will show complex bonding in compounds. 
and then at the bottom we have elements many of them will occur in free state or will occur as weak sulphide tellurides etcetera etcetera. Many will not be attacked by acids at all unless it is a very special kind of acid like aqua regia and things like that. So, as the reactivities go down the nature of compounds also become different weaker compounds here stronger compounds on top. Accordingly our extraction processes also change. Then we started with pyrometallurgy which was the ancient method because when men human when first invented fire they experimented a great deal with fire starting with cooking of food roasting of animals then they saw the effect of fire on mud mud became clay when it was heated to a certain temperature the clay was much stronger it did not dissolve in water so clay pots could be made into into pots which are very stable then they found accidentally some metals elements uh, some minerals decompose like if there was mercury sulphide it decomposes produce uh, mercury then accidentally or by design or by trial and error they they learn to apply pyrometallurgy in the production of bronze in the production of lead in the production of iron in the production of various alloys advantages of pyrometallurgy is that compounds become less stable at high temperatures so even if you have stable compounds compounds become unstable so you have to bring in a reducing agents it, it the element will get separated from wh whatever it is combining reaction rates will be high because in kinetics you know temperature is high and reaction rates are high then at high temperature some reduction reactions become feasible which cannot be done at room temperature can be done at high temperature and there is a greater ease of separation of metal and slag so clean liquid metal can be separated out. Now, there are many many steps in any roasting operation oxidizing first is roasting you roast Ox and in roasting there is necessarily release or some gaseous substance oxidizing roasting means you change say carbonate into an oxide volatilizing roasting means you take out some volatiles chloridizing roasting means you make a chloride reduction roasting means you reduce there are different kinds of reduction techniques in pyrometallurgy one can reduce by carbon one one can reduce by metals one can reduce simply by heating there are some reactions that you know a reducing agent reacting with a compound will release the reducing agent sometimes the reducing the metal that comes out is gas sometimes it can be solid or liquid sometimes what you form by by the combination of the reducing agent and what was there with the metal that can be gas that can be solid there are all kinds of combinations thermal dissociation as i said mercury sulfide sometimes simply by heating we can recover the metal and you know that sometimes vacuum has a role to play in all this if there is a gaseous substance on the right vacuum would drive the reaction to the right if there is a gaseous substance on the left hand side reaction can be driven by use of pressure I gave you refer to some books that you might find useful there are many other books then you came to a very important subject this is a basis of pyrometallurgy the standard free energy diagram for oxides also known as Eringham diagrams which plot free energies of formation against temperature and these plots are always with reference to one molecule of oxygen because that helps us in our when we associate two reactions we can we can add or divide 
we can subtract one from the other and very easily one H O 2 and one O 2 will get cancelled out. Now, in this plot the thing to note is for all oxides all metal oxides the plot goes upward which means the free energy of formation becomes less negative with temperature all metal and that be becoming less negative means they are becoming less stable. On the other hand when carbon reacts to form CO2 the free energy of formation hardly changes with temperature, but when we consider formation of CO we find it has a negative slope. These have a positive slope the line for CO2 has 0 slope line for CO has negative slope. The slope is related to change in entropy all these have a reaction indicating metal with one molecule of oxygen forming the oxide and all these reactions imply disappearance of one molecule of oxygen and that is what gives a change in entropy it is the same for all. In the case of C plus O2 giving CO2 same amount of gas on the left hand side same number of moles on the right hand side slope is 0 here it is the other way around you find C 2 C plus O 2 is 2 C O. So, when one mole of molecule of oxygen disappears two molecules of C O are produced. So, we have a negative slope and this is of great importance in fire metals. It shows that this line crosses all the lines for the oxide. So, there is always a point where carbon monoxide becomes more stable compared to the line for the metal oxide and when that happens carbon can reduce the oxide to form release the metal and form carbon monoxide. Now, for metals which are more stable like aluminum, zirconium etcetera, etcetera the crossing point is at a much higher temperature you have to go to much higher temperature whereas, when the metals are not so stable the oxides are not so stable they can be reduced by carbon to into form C when it forms CO at a much lower temperature. So, essentially everything can be reduced by carbon, but there is a problem. Oxides which are very stable and according to Ellington's diagram can be reduced at very high temperature also form stable carbides. So, very often carbon reduction will not be applicable to them. We have to find something else to do it. Say if we have BEO which is very stable you will find the line for BEO is fairly low down BEO plus carbon if we do we will produce beryllium with carbide, but we do the reaction in presence of copper. So, we produce a beryllium copper alloy where the beryllium activity is very low having copper drives the reaction not to the right no having the copper produces beryllium copper activity of beryllium is low therefore, the reaction is driven to the right activity is low means it will not form a carbide. Another advantage is here in the industry you want beryllium carbide, but it is not applicable in all cases we like to avoid carbide formation. I will stop here now and proceed further because I would like to uh, review the entire course very quickly. Thank you very much.